Welcome to the Wonderfest studio here in the Omega sector of the Milky Way galaxy. I am lucky today to be accompanied by Andy Fracknoy, the foremost public astronomer in the San Francisco Bay Area. Andy is the chair of the astronomy department at Foothill College, and he is also, among his many awards, the first recipient of Wonderfest's Carl Sagan Prize for science popularization. Welcome, Andy. Nice to be with you. Andy, I grew up learning that there were nine planets in the solar system. I've recently been told, however, that a certain diminutive outer planet named Pluto has gotten booted from the club. Can you help me understand why? Yes, this is one of the biggest public relations issues that astronomy has had to face. What have we mean and nasty astronomers done to Pluto? So, I like to explain what actually happened, which is a more nuanced and complicated story than you often hear, by going back a little bit in history. Um, I want to take us back to about 1799 and 1800, about 200 years ago or more. Uh, this was a time when we were starting to understand a lot about the solar system, and we saw that the spacing of the planets, as you went away from the sun, had an oddity in it. As you looked at how the planets were spaced, there seemed to be a hole, a kind of missing orbit between Mars and Jupiter. And in those days, we were very interested in regularities, and so astronomers worried a lot about why there was this extra large spacing between Mars and Jupiter, and whether we hadn't perhaps missed a planet between those two worlds that was waiting for us to discover it. And astronomers actually started a campaign to search for it. A German group actually called itself the Missing Planets Bureau, and they were going to find that planet between Mars and Jupiter. But they were actually beaten to it uh, by a Sicilian astronomer uh, who, on the very first day of the new millennium, found a planet, a very small planet, between Mars and Jupiter. He called it Ceres, C-E-R-E-S, after the Sicilian god of grain and harvest. And there it was, the world that everyone had been searching for between Mars and Jupiter. Sure, it was oddly small, but it was there. The Germans, though, were so upset that an Italian astronomer had found it instead of a German astronomer that they refused to give up, and they kept looking. And a few years later, by gum, they found the planet too, between Mars and Jupiter. This was a bigger shock even perhaps than the first one, that there were two, but they weren't in quite the same orbit. Now the Germans were happy. In fact, they were so happy they kept looking. And lo and behold, eventually they found another small planet between Mars and Jupiter. And then another after that. And so this was getting to be a little spooky. What were all these worlds doing between Mars and Jupiter? And the more people kept looking, the more worlds, particularly smaller worlds, they found. Um, soon we realized that there was actually a belt of objects. We found, especially with the beginning of photography, where we could really record faint bits of light, that there were thousands of objects between Mars and Jupiter, many of them very small, and so we had to give them a new name. First, we called them minor planets, because they seemed smaller versions of planets, but the name that really stuck was asteroids. There is a belt of asteroids between Mars and Jupiter, and then Cirrus is celebrated as the largest and the historically most important of this belt of asteroids. Now, I tell this long, boring historical story because it has a direct relevance to what happened with Pluto. In 1930, we found a planet beyond Neptune. This planet was a little bit odd. It was different in quality and quantity from the other outer planets. It was smaller than Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Its orbit was a little different from the regular outer planets, but nevertheless, there it was, beyond Neptune, orbiting the Sun. So we called it a planet, and eventually, at the suggestion of a British schoolgirl, we gave it the name Pluto. 
And between 1930 and the end of the 20th century, Pluto was studied and understood and <coughs> celebrated as the ninth planet in the solar system. But again, the same thing happened. New discoveries changed our view. So in the last decade of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, astronomers with better equipment began to discover other worlds beyond Neptune. There were other objects, some of them small, but some of them about the size of Pluto, orbiting beyond Pluto. The one that really got to us was one that for a while looked like it was a little bigger than Pluto. Now, with better measurement, it looks like it's about the same size as Pluto, but still quite distinctly another world just like Pluto. We eventually called it Eris, which is the name of the mythological goddess of discord and trouble, because this was the world, Eris was the world, that made so much trouble for Pluto. Once Eris was discovered and other Pluto-like objects were discovered out there, and there were five or so known, um, uh, we said, we can't just keep calling these planets. It's not fair to sixth graders to make them memorize all these names. So ultimately, we had a meeting of the UN of Astronomers, the International Astronomical Union, to say, what are we going to do about the discovery of five Plutos and thousands of smaller worlds beyond Neptune? Again, we seem to have a belt, because this, was, this belt was actually predicted in some ways by a Dutch-American astronomer named Gerard Kuiper. We now call it the Kuiper Belt. But if we had another belt, beyond Neptune, just like we have a belt between Mars and Jupiter, we needed to find a new name for the little planets in that belt. And that's where we may have made uh, a public relations mistake. The term minor planet was already taken. So we said, well, what are we going to call them? And we decided on dwarf planets. And high challenge people didn't like that name, and dwarf is sometimes used as an insult. And so uh, there was a, an outcry about should we really call them dwarf planets out there? But whatever we ultimately wind up calling them, they are just like the asteroids, a new category of interesting members of the solar system. And Pluto takes the place of pride. It is perhaps the largest and certainly the historically most important member of the Kuiper Belt. So yes, it was a demotion in the sense that it's not a regular planet anymore, but it is the pioneering member of a whole new class of worlds. And that should sound reassuring to people who are Pluto fans. Do you think the sadness with which many people have greeted the demotion of Pluto is linked to its name connection to that beloved dog? No. I, I, there are a lot of reasons why people were upset. First, the media love a story of, pardon the expression, an underdog of some kind. Um, so I think the media, it was a slow news day, so they made quite a bit of it. Um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's a, a, a popularizer of astronomy, uh, had, was just building a new planetarium in New York uh, called the Rose Center, and he left it out of the planet walk there and that. You know, anything that happens in New York, the media lap up. Um, and it, there was a feeling that Pluto had been the only planet discovered by an American, and that somehow this might have been a political move connected with some of America's foreign policy under the Bush administration. I think that had very little to do with it. But I think people had a fondness for Pluto because it was the last planet discovered. It was the smallest planet. It was a planet found by an American farm boy with no training in astronomy. So there was a, a kind of a romance to the story. And nobody likes getting kicked out of any club. So people identified with being kicked out of a club. But I think once people understand, certainly in my classes, once students understand the full story, and they hear about the asteroid belt, and they hear about the Kuiper belt, and they understand what astronomers did, they're much better able to come to terms with this great tragedy. You've helped me to come to terms with it, too. Thank you, Andy. Good.